read that and you listen. Philippians 1 for you. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, uh, Lord, for your goodness to us. Thank you that you're coming someday. Lord, until you come, you've expected us to live a certain way, a life that is full of thanks. Thanks to you, thanks for other Christians, Lord, uh, and in our own life, that it would be a life of gratitude and thanks because we have loved and participated in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that we would live a life worthy of that. I pray if there be one here today that all these words today are seem nonsense or are certainly not true in their life. They have no understanding. I pray you open their heart today, what it means to know you, to walk with you, to give their life in submission to you. I pray for your children, Lord, who do know you. I ask that you would help them to see the gravity of their life, the gravity of their testimony, the choices that they make day by day. And Lord, just work. We ask that your spirit would work for We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. They say three is a charm. God has given me the privilege of preaching this passage three times in my life. The first was at CBC, Calvary Baptist Church in Pottstown, and I was a seminary student. I was more than wet behind the ears. I was assigned it. I didn't even want to do it. I was assigned this passage by my professor, Dr. Sam Harbin, to preach on a Wednesday night. And you say, oh, that's not bad, Pastor. You only had 10 there on Wednesday night. No, this was Calvary Baptist Church in Lansdale. We had 300 there on a Wednesday night. So the first time I publicly had to preach, I had to preach this passage, a passage I didn't even have a clue about, but he gave it to me to do. It was one of the first times, like I said, I ever preached to a live audience because I had preached a couple times in a nursing home, but not too sure they actually heard or understood what I said. Like I said, it was a live audience, okay? I went to a really tough rest home. I mean, it was, it was rough. A little sideshow. I, I had one, one time I preached there, there's one lady, she would walk in, she'd shuffle in, and she would never sit. She just would shuffle in, and she was, I think she was a kleptomaniac in her former life because she'd steal everything. She tried to steal my Bible. She tried to steal the podium on which my Bible was on. And so the whole time I was preaching, I would grab the podium, and I'd come over to here, and she'd shuffle over there, and then I'd pick it up and go over here. So it just was going on the whole time. And uh, like I said, not, not exactly people that are hearing and understanding. These were saints I looked up to. I admired them. Uh, they were sound in the faith, many, many of them. I had great respect for them. And my sermon on this passage was a total bomb. (laughs) They came up and said, great job, great job. I know know you're lying. (laughs) This thing's a bomb. I had no, and as, as you read it, it's a letter of thanks, right? It's a thanks to a church that he had ministered to, known them. And, you know, I was like, Pastor Harbin, I'm a seminary student. I've never been a pastor. I've never been a preacher. I've never had, you know, it's a total bomb. Total bomb. The second time was the exact opposite. 
I preached to my fellow laborers in Christ at Potsdam after I had left. One of the times I went back, I preached this passage to them. It was a church that I had served in for 10 years. I was an assistant pastor for 10 of those years. It was a church I knew very well. It was people I had ministered with. I knew their lives. They knew my life. And it meant, it meant the world to me because I was now separated from them. Because this is where Paul's at in his life. He's separated from them. So um, I went calling with them. I, I knew their lives. I knew their testimonies. And I could preach this with all my heart because there was a bond of love between us that was forged in the service of Jesus Christ. And I missed them. Time has, I, I don't miss them as much, but, you know, at that time, I missed them greatly, being apart from them. Um. The third time's today. And I must be frank, it was difficult in preparing. Because the book is still being written about us, isn't it? This is a look back. The first part, anyway, and a look forward. But the look back part of it is kind of, it's still being written, isn't it, in our lives? We are not separated from each other. We're together. And I know for some we have this bond, uh, you know, as I thought, well, if we were ever separated, how would I feel towards that person? Or how would they feel towards me? I, I know that we have that bond, some of us. And it would be painful to be separated from them, from you. Yet it would be joyous would be joyous because we served and are serving the Lord in the furtherance and the fellowship of the gospel. But there is some consternation here. I guess it's because I'm now the senior pastor, not just an assistant. Much more is on my shoulders. The expectations of this bond that we should have, I guess the expectations are a lot higher than it was when I was just the assistant. But I think at times, frankly, at times it seems lacking. And it seems regrettable to me. I don't know about that to you, but it seems that way to me. The ministry cup of joy to me in this area of service is sometimes half empty. I want it to be full. Don't you want it to be full? I want it to be full. But frankly, at times it's not. The only thing that can change that is that we be true yoke fellowship yoke fellows together in fellowship of the gospel and in service of the ministry of Jesus Christ. I guess I feel that way when things don't go well. And it feels like others just don't want to participate in certain things. And that's hard. It's hard. Today we reach our first joy producer. I still haven't given you the list of joy killers and joy stealers. We'll do that one in the next couple of weeks. But this is the first joy producer. Joy is produced by serving Jesus Christ together. Again, you cannot get joy down in the store. It doesn't come in a bottle. You cannot get a prescription from it for it from a doctor or from me. It is only comes through a deep and abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. But the joy of this joy producer is that it also comes when others have that bond in Christ with you also. The fellowship when two have the same heartbeat for God, it is that Jonathan David kind of thing. It is the Paul and the Philippian believers in the church of Philippi. It is that bond that they had. It is a heartbeat for God that if separated from one another, it doesn't produce a sad face. It produces joy. Why does it produce joy? Because of the thankfulness upon remembrance 
of that sharing in the gospel of Christ with one another. You need to have a life worthy of thanks, a life worthy of thanks. The book of Philippians has many reoccurring patterns, and one of them is that Paul looked back and he reminisces. He's, he's kind of like the old reminiscer. <laughs> he's always doing that, and he certainly always does that in the beginning of his book. But even throughout the book of Philippians, we're going to have many. He's always looking back, uh, and, but he's always looking forward to the day of the Lord. And some of the songs we sang today, and what I read today, the day of the Lord, he's always looking forward to, right? And really, that is the Christian life, isn't it? We're always looking back to what God has done in saving us, and we're always looking forward to the day we'll be with him. And then there's this big parenthesis called what? The Christian life. And he's going to get into all of these, these past, present, and future throughout this whole thing. So, but we see this in this opening section of the gratitude and prayer uh, of this pattern. It has... Uh, two main sections, and we're going to investigate both of those together. The first is a gratitude in prayer, a gratitude in prayer. I thank my God, in verse 3, upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, with all, with, for you all making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day into now, being confident of this very thing, that he that begun a, which have begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ even as it is meet for me to get to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, in as much as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. An expression of thanks and joy when remembering past and present service. service. Is the relationship between you and other Christians deeper than any other relationships you have in life? Is it? Is it? And if it isn't, should it be? Should it be? You know, between you and that person next to you or across the aisle and also between you and your pastor, is it that close? Is it that deep? It is deeper than blood relatives, uh, neighbors, and non-Christian relationship. Is it that deep? You know, God calls this bond fellowship. We've been having great emphasis on that in the last year or so. Fellowship. You know, fellowship's a big thing for Paul. It's a big thing for him in this letter. The Greek word is koinonia. And it means fellowship, joining together through joint participation. It is sharing together, sharing what one has with another. Of the 13, 13 of the 19 times it is used in the New Testament, it is used by the Apostle Paul. And four of them are in Philippians. So it's pretty significant. Let's look at them. The one I just read, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day into now, verse 1, 5, chapter 2, verse 1. If there be any, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any bowels and mercies, chapter 3, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. And then finally, in an alternate form in 4.15, now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me concerning giving and receiving, but you also. And I believe it is in that word giving, okay? That participation, that fellowship that you had. And he uses the word giving. In that. Fellowship is more than sharing a meal together. Let us part of it. True fellowship is sharing the gospel. Sharing in the life of Jesus Christ, which is centered in that gospel. 
And they say, how can I share that? <laughs> you can and you must. It is this fellowship with the Lord in good times and with other people in good times and bad times. And it sends Paul into this giving a thanks for, to God for these believers. Do you have this kind of fellowship with one another? Does it produce a remembrance of overwhelming thanks when you think of him, her, across the aisle, me? Our thanksgiving and our gratitude for other Christians that we serve in Christ in the gospel has three components in these verses. Number one, a gratitude that is joyful, verses four and five. The joy was produced in the crucible of partaking in the proclamation and the defense of the gospel. My fondest memories in the Christian life have been my joy of serving with others and sharing the gospel. I, you know, when I look back on my Christian life, uh, you know, that, that's the thing <laughs> that makes me the happiest in my Christian life. Serving side by side. But, you know, it's not just side by side physically. I mean, I could give you a list of people, my calling buddies and calling partners, all right? And, uh, but I'm not going to do that today. But it's also, it's also serving and participating with other people from one end of the earth to the other, right? That's the greatness of the gospel ministry. I can serve in the gospel and have fellowship with someone all the way across the world. One of my buddies just left on a plane to go to the Fiji Islands. Him and I talk. We don't talk that often, but when we talk, there, there's this knit right away. We have the same heart, same passion, and that's to share the gospel. So it doesn't matter. Whether it was with a roofer, a pastor, a missionary, a razor of beef, or southeastern Pennsylvania, a, Jordan, a Georgian by way of Oregon and Alaska, a biker turned evangelical, <laughs> a missionary in Mexico by way of Alabama. And I know the list can go on and on. People I'm thankful for. And they give me great joy. It doesn't matter uh, what does, you know, where they're at. That doesn't, that doesn't matter. What does matter is the gratitude that they're there because of the submission of Christ and proclaiming and sharing in the furtherance of God's work, the gospel. The life of another upon remembrance is like, to me, is like jumping into the pool of joy. You know what I mean, the pool of joy? Do we have it up? Oh, he doesn't have it up. Remember Jenny Lake last week? One of the pictures that will come up is one of my pictures, and we put joy across it. Uh, Nicole did. That's Jenny Lake. I'm sure if I would have jumped into that <laughs> July in that, in that lake, in July of all times, it still would have been about 45, 50 degrees, if not even colder than that. But jumping into the pool of joy, have you ever jumped into it? It's a wonderful pool. And you know what? It's big for everyone else to come in. It refreshes your heart and life. The joy of someone else. The joy of someone who else is obedient in Jesus Christ and the furtherance of the gospel. Whether you're giving or receiving, it doesn't matter. You, you see that? Paul's receiving, and he's giving joy. They have joy because they get to give to Paul in the furtherance of the gospel. And you're saying, what joy is there in giving all kinds of money? There's great joy, is there not? Every time a soul is saved in Raki Raki or Indonesia... with the Elliots or the Millers down in South Africa. It doesn't matter. There's joy. There's joy to jump into that pool. If there's no joy of remembrance with one another, it is because there is no participation or little participation in the gospel. So I guess that's one of your joy stealers 
or joy killers. No participation in the things of the gospel. Secondly, there's a gratitude that is confident. Our memory verse, being confident of this very thing, that he that which begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. A gratitude that is confident. He took a sober look back at the salvation and the service, and he took a look forward to the completion of their character. When Lord, the Lord returns, he's going he's gonna, to you know, break this out and fill it out later as we go through this passage. When he thought about what God had done for them in salvation and what he is doing for them right now and what he shall do for them in the future, it got him on his knees. And he prayed and he remembered. He remembered God's sanctification of them in salvation, what his ultimate sanctification will be in heaven. Our sanctification rests on God's power and his faithfulness to fulfill his work. My confidence isn't in you, <laughs> right? And your confidence shouldn't be in me. My confidence is in him. I'm confident what he will do and what he is doing in our hearts, in our life. He will fulfill because he is faithful. What God began, God will complete. We must tr just avail ourselves to him and be willing to allow him to do it through us, through submission and obedience to his will. And he was confident that he was confident in these believers based upon their past and their present faithfulness to God in their life. Thirdly, a gratitude that is proper. Gratitude that is proper. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all. It is meet for me to think of you all. It's some words that we don't usually work, use, but a better translation, it is proper. It's proper for me to do this. This thankfulness that he had for these believers, it was proper. Because of their fellowship and their partaking in the sufferings of Christ with them, and now in his present ministry, present ministry. Once again, joy and its sister, okay? Joy has a sister, all right? And her name is thankfulness. Thankfulness for others usually grows and is strengthened during times of trial, persecution, and suffering because Christian joy is a result of knowing that the ultimate victory belongs to who? God. Who provided the victory over sin, death, and darkness in this present life and world. Thankfulness and joy are produced in suffering through, for, together with other believers in the spread of the gospel. These people gave financial support, but they also gave prayer support and other expressions of their love and word and deed to Paul. Paul gives three reasons why he's thankful. The first was that he had them in his heart. They were in his heart. They were they're, they're there forever. There are certain Christians, whether they're in heaven or not, you know, they're forever in my heart. Never going to go. There was this strong emotional bond between pastor and the flock because they had true blending of hearts and it was forged by their love and, to and their desire to give out the gospel. There are Christians from my former church upon hearing their name or God bringing them to my mind always results in this warmness in my heart. And it brings joy. And thankfulness. There's also a remembrance of other Christians in my life that brings not prayers of thanksgiving, but prayers of God, please work and change and do. Complete your work in them. And you may ask why. Why does it seem you have joy for one and not there's no joy for others? Why? Because they are forever in my heart because of their devotion to Christ and to me. To me. See, the real trust is when you're separated, right? Will the bond, will the love still be there? I don't know. I'm not separated from you. I'm here. 
but I know from those in my past, I still get cards, still get money. Most of all, I'm, I go back to their churches and I see my name on the prayer list, still praying for me, still praying, still praying for you six years later. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. That gives me a warmness of heart and a great thankfulness. True love and devotion and relationships are not hindered by circumstances, are they? Their love for him and his love for their, them, nothing was ever going to get in the way of that. Nothing. They made no excuses. Oh, I always hear the excuses. <laughs> Why they don't give, why they don't share, why they don't participate. Pastors could write a book on excuses, some of which are their own, but some of which are others. There is no excuses. They would stand for no obstacles in ministering to and with Paul because when you truly love someone, when you truly love someone, there are no excuses. And there are no obstacles that could ever, that cannot be removed in that relationship. Can others in this congregation and me say for, of you now or in the future, you know, when I think of so-and-so, when I think of so-and-so, I am so thankful for them because in the good times and in the bad times, I could count on them. See, that's a life worthy of thanks. Do you have that? The final reason in verse 8 kind of sounds like an oath, doesn't it? For God is my record. <laughs> he calls God, upon, God to be his witness. It's like, Paul, man, I, I don't think we're supposed to do oaths. Like, he does one. He calls God to be his record of how much he loves them. That's how integrity, that's how strong this is and how true the love was. He calls God to be the, bring God to the witness stand that he had such a deep and total bond of emotion for these believers. You know, I am not one that advocates that we ought to act upon and rely upon emotions because they can be fleeting <laughs> and wrong sometimes, right? But this kind of love, this kind of bond, this kind of emotion that he felt for them, from his bowels, he says, from his innermost parts, his love and devotion to them and their love and devotion for him, it was true, it was real. That's true emotion. That's good. And that's healthy. And it needs to be there. I'm, I'm for that kind of emotion. Second point, a petition for future growth and completeness. He now takes a look forward. He offers up another prayer, verse 9 through 11. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in judge, knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve the things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory of and praise of God. You know, this prayer of Paul for the spiritual welfare of the Philippians is almost identical with the prayer he had made, he makes for the Colossians. It's the same verses, too. Turn to Colossians 1, 9 through 11. Colossians 1, 9 through 11. And go forward in your Bible. Colossians 1, 9 through 11. It almost sounds exactly the same. And this is a church he has a prayer for that he probably never even, he doesn't even know the people. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthen with all might according to the glorious power until all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. <laughs> Almost identical. 
This tells us something, not only about the essential need of Christian's growth, but it also tells us that in the mind of God, spiritual growth for every Christian is a consistent matter. His prayer for the Colossians was the same as the prayer for the Philippians because it was God's desire of spiritual growth and completeness. The elements of spiritual growth are definable and they are consistent and this prayer contains two requests. First, a prayer for love to grow in our lives in verses 1, 9 through 10b. They were already characterized by true biblical love and self-sacrifice that benefited others as evidenced by their sacrifice sacrificial giving in the gospel ministry and their personal outreach with the gospel to those in Macedonia and beyond. They were characterized by unconditional love, but there is always room for growth. You and I have a tremendous capacity to love. You can love more than one person. Some people seem to only love self. <laughs> it's not, that's not love. That's a false love. But you can love others, and you can love millions of people. You have the capacity for it. God's love expressed through you and in you has no boundaries, because that's the kind of love that it is. It has no boundaries. And it is evident in our lives to everyone we come in contact with, and is to follow in the wake of every aspect of our living. This true biblical love is not puppy dog love. But it is according to knowledge and insight. You see that? That your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in judgment. It's not emotional love. It's true. It's based upon a knowledge and insight. These two qualities provide the environment in which love can grow in our lives. First, knowledge. This knowledge is not, uh, is not textbook knowledge. You can't get it by watching Christian Jeopardy, okay? It doesn't happen that way. It is relational knowledge. It is based upon, it, upon experience. It's a growing love for somebody that's ex experiential. Um, we should read and grow in our understanding of who Christ is, but the best test or proof is not that we can score well on an exam, but rather the proof is in the knowledge of Christ on how it affects your living. Experiential knowledge in how you treat your spouse and your words and your action, how you treat your children, your coworkers, your family. It is practically applying what you know in your, into your relationships with others. When we met last night for the foundations class. I hit on this. It's like this, you know, we talked about this over and over again. That's what real love's about. It's relational. It affects your husband-wife relationship. It affects ch children-parent relationship. It affects your church relationship, it affects how you, everyone outside of you. The second quality is judgment. It's better understood as insight or wisdom. That's what's here. It's not judgment like handing down a decision to a case. It's more like insight. You grow an insight in your Christian life. The word judgment or depth of insight occurs only here in the entire New Testament. It's the only use of this, ver this, this word in all the New Testament. It conveys a sense of moral discretion or moral discernment. A moral life making right moral choices affects your spiritual growth and love and your expression of your love to others. You cannot be immoral in love. You have to be moral. These two, knowledge and moral discretion, provide the environment in which love can grow in your life. If either of them is lacking, then love will not be growing in your relationships. 
Failure to grow in your knowledge and your personal walk with Christ, as he expects, hinders love. And similar, failure to discipline your moral life will hinder your love also. Right? Dave, David could not say, I, I love you other five wives <laughs> when he's, you know, with Bathsheba. It just doesn't work, right? The result of such a growing light will be discernment. Notice he gives these purpose clauses. When you see the word that, okay, that usually is giving you a result or a purpose clause, and he does that here in verse 10a, that you may approve the things that are excellent. Love should be growing. Understanding should be growing. Knowledge should be growing. Insight should be growing in our lives. And here's the reason why, that you may approve the things that are excellent. The word here... For approve is dokimatsu. It has the idea to test or to approve by fire or trial. We should not just allow anything and everything into our lives, but test them through the word of God, not just to discern whether they are proper, but whether they are the best choice. We fail that sometimes. We fail to understand that. I have people in my own life now that make decisions that are right, maybe, and in our own mind may be right. I may say they're wrong, but it doesn't matter. I'm not, I'm not, the, I'm not the standard for what's right and wrong, right? God's word is, and he is. But their choices may be proper, but they're not the best. We should seek the best and approve and test things that are the best in our life. It is the ability and the will to di 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 differentiate between highest matters and side issues. There's plenty of side issues out there. But what are the best? What are the highest matters of life? Those are what we should incorporate into our life. And that only happens when we grow in our knowledge and insight as we walk with Jesus Christ. Many Christians lack love because they lack knowledge and insight, but also because they just want to get by and not thrive. Or they just get caught up on side issues of life, not giving themselves to the excellent things, the best things of this life. They live by the motto, perfect is the enemy of good enough. You and I are to strive for and embrace not just the good, but embrace and strive for the best, the best of the good choices. You had three choices, what's the best of the best in your life? Well, if I do that, people will think that I'm a Pharisee or I'm self-righteous. Don't worry what others think. Live for Christ, what he knows to be best and right. Finally, to sum up this growth in love so that it abounds more and more in our lives, a growing love is fed by proper knowledge and moral insight, which enables one to see what is best and the best way to live, the wise way to live, in light of the day of Christ's coming. Remember, we all have a date that we are going to meet someday, and that's with God. What's he going to say? A prayer for love to grow in our lives, but also a prayer for complete character. Um, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. According to that first part, the nature of character that is complete in Christ is one that is both pure and blameless. I don't, there, you may not have that in there, you have. I have sincere and without offense. Some may say pure and, uh, and pure and blameless. I think that's the best uh, definition of those words. This word sincere is better pure, as I said. It occurs only one place in the New Testament other than here, and that's in 2 Peter 3.1. You can read that on your own. We're running out of time. It has the meaning of to hold up to the sunlight for inspection. You ever do that? Yeah. Is this right? <laughs> It is, 
having pure, complete integrity. Is this, is this the right thing? You could do that with a dollar bill, right? Is this, is this genuine? Our life, our life, God wants it to be pure. When it, he puts his light on it, what does it show? That could scare you or that may be joy. Depends on the purity of your life. To be found pure when unfolded and examined by sunlight, a zeal to be vindicated no matter how through thorough examination. A second component is this word blameless. It means to be free of blame from those outside of you. Blamelessness is a purity of one's testimony without offense. It has the idea of to not lead into sin, to be blameless. A zeal never to be a stumbling block to others or oneself. The environment where these two two components can be realized is practicing and bearing the fruit of righteousness, he says. It's a spirit-filled, spirit-controlled life led by the Spirit of God to bear fruit in all areas of the Christian life. This is the harvest of the Christian life, a life of right living. Paul's prayer for them and mine for you is that you would live a life in such a way that Christ could work in you the harvest of morality and righteousness, which would be acceptable to him at his second coming. Once again, the prayer for completeness and character has a purpose, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God that we would reflect the glory of God in our lives. Our ultimate calling as believers is to glorify God, to reflect his nature, his character in our lives. This is the Christian life. This is a great prayer. It's a great prayer for yourself as well as those in your life. Pray to God that those in your life will grow in love and in their character and would be heading in direction to the completeness in Christ. That's a good prayer for each and every one, each and every day, isn't it? You know, someday you and I will stand before God in glory. Twice he mentions the second coming here. Someday you and I will stand before Christ. What will be our memories of one another? What will be our memories? What will be Jesus' testimony in and through us? What will it have been? It will be past then. Will it be gratefulness? Will we all look at one another and be grateful? Not that we just made it, (laughs) okay? Not that just we're with one another in heaven. Not just gratefulness that we're here, but a true, genuine gratefulness and thankfulness. I'm thankful for Tim. I'm thankful for Candy. I'm thankful for Chris. I'm thankful for their lives. Thankful for their service in the gospel. Will it produce joy on that day or sorrow? Will it be proper? Will my thankfulness of you be right in the sight of God? Does he share the same view, Jesus Christ, as I do of you or you of me? Or is there impurity? Blame. Shame. Were we striving together through our walk with God to grow spiritually? And although not perfect, we were perfecting it in time. Or were we lazy, haphazard, apathetic in our walk with Jesus Christ? That's not thankful. That won't produce any joy nor will it produce any praise and glory of God. One thing's for sure. 
It will, because of Jesus Christ and his grace in our lives, be one, but uh, it will be there. It will be there because we will be perfected at that time. Is your life worthy of thanks? Is it worthy of thanks? Does it bring joy and warmness of heart? You know, the choice is yours. And the choice is mine. The choice is yours if you allow Jesus Christ to complete what he has started in you. It didn't end the day you accepted Christ. It was just beginning. And it goes all the way to the day of his coming. Will it be joy? Will it be gratefulness? Will it be thankfulness when we remember and look back? choice is yours. The choice is mine. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your grace. Lord, these are all great thoughts that Paul had of these believers. I pray they'd be true of us. The reality of it, Lord, is being made every day, whether we believe it or not. We'll all go home today and we'll all wake up tomorrow if you don't return. Will the decisions that we make, the prayers that we offer up, the life that we live, the gospel that we participate in, will it be the gospel of Jesus Christ or will it be the gospel of self? and worldliness. Lord, only you know. My hope and my prayer is that, Lord, we would all seek to be pure in you and blameless upon your coming, to be fully complete, that you would have done everything and anything in our lives that you desired, and we received it by faith and trust in you. Lord, if there would be one here today,